There's a point where the idea of a monster becomes less scary than a lack of one. Video games are an art form that did something incredibly special. Up until this point in humanity's existence, the art we had hanging up in museums and exhibits existed in our world. The walls that contained our paintings and movies were really nothing special. On the other side of those walls, we had everything else. Even though these works create a brand new world in our minds, we only see a window of it. This is not everything, and we work mentally to fill out the rest of those details. It's how we get immersed. We take these worlds and treat them like they're real. Video games, though, operate very differently. When you play a video game, that window is ever-changing. We get to explore every corner, every pixel, every model and sprite and voice line and mechanic. And if we keep pushing those limits as humans are always going to do, we might find something that we're not supposed to see. This is the Out of Bounds, and it's eerie. For my entire life, anytime I managed to glance beyond the walls of a video game and peer into what I'm not supposed to see, I felt a dread in the back of my mind. Something disturbed me about it, and only recently have I truly started to understand why. And the answer is, well, a lot of things. Trust me, we have a lot to go through, so let's start at something you're familiar with. Human beings. There is something that's ever-present in humanity, something that's so buried in our psychology and society that it seems so obvious that it's boring. As humans, we are limited. Those limits define almost everything about us and the world around us. We almost never know what those limits actually are, and it seems like they're always being pushed, but we know that they're there, almost instinctively. When it comes to creating things, it's no different. Canvases have a limited space, movies are only so long, but it all seems natural. All of these limited things take up space and time in the very same world. They all ball up together into what we call everything. But not video games. It may seem normal to us now, but video games are literally otherworldly. While we control them from ours, they take place in a different universe entirely. It can and almost always has different properties and functions. Impossible things are made possible, and that fantastical nature of them is a big reason as to why people find them so fun and interesting. It's a universe that's not ours that we can still interact with. However, just like any other human-made thing, video games are incredibly limited. You can walk away from a painting, you live before and after you watch a movie, but once you leave a video game world, well, you can't. In these places, there isn't in everything. There's inbounds, and then... nothing. Now, for people who want to make immersive video games, this whole infinite darkness thing is kind of an issue, and developers and game studios have spent millions trying their best to hide it. And while the many, many ways developers work to immerse people in video game worlds is fascinating, that's a topic for another video and another person. The real meat here for me is the games that either don't or can't hide it. A lot of games, especially older ones meant to run on more limited software, know they can't really convince the player but try to anyway. In a game like Borderlands 2, it makes use of what I like to call soft limits. Most areas are big, elevated land islands, surrounded almost entirely by steep cliffs. Most people have played video games long enough to know what a massive, imposing cliffside means. Also, like, people who know what death is. For the places where they can't justify a several hundred foot tall cliff, which is less than you think, and where they can't place a bunch of conveniently connected obstacles, games tend to use a warning system. There's no barrier to stop you, necessarily, but if you step a bit too far off the beaten path, something happens to ward you off. In Borderlands and some Call of Duty games, you're given a timer. If it counts down to zero, you die. Pretty easy. In the best bad game that I've ever played, Seven Days to Die, the map is surrounded by a radioactive wasteland that slowly chips away at your health as you try to traverse it. Now, even though we know in these games exactly where we are and aren't allowed to go, it still kind of works. There's no person on Earth who sees deep into the barely textured desert wasteland about 10 miles out and 2 miles down and thinks, I can go there, but our brains find it way better than some empty skybox. And why is that? Well, while humans are very limited, our brains have a way to trick us into thinking otherwise. You might have heard the phrase, perception is reality before, and while it is true, it's kind of vague. So let me introduce two different concepts, absolute truth and functional truth. 
When I show you this color, there's many different ways to describe it. It's a warm color, the hex code is BB230C, it's opaque, monochromatic, etc. I could go into the history of the color, the first time it was ever used, even the specific place that I actually got it, which was from this frame of the critically acclaimed movie Akira. However, if you had to communicate to me what this color is, you'd probably just say... red. While everything I said before now is true, we don't communicate everything we know about something as simple as the color red. Many things are unknowable, some information is useless or redundant, but everything I said and infinitely more would fall under the idea of absolute truth, complete information about something. But while there are an infinite number of shades of red, all we need to say most of the time is red to get the message across to another person. This is the difference between absolute truth and functional truth. While absolute truth is an entire mural, one that's both large and incredibly detailed, we can only see small parts of it at any given time. If we stare closely at the specifics, we can't see the bigger picture. If we view out as far as we can, those details aren't visible anymore. We can only perceive so much about any given thing at any given time, and our brain is built around filling those gaps in our perception. When we look over the edge at a landscape we know is fake and barely textured, our brain simply fills in the details. It's nothing new, really. No matter what we understand, intellectually, that there is nothing there, we still see it, and that's good enough. However, even with the ability to trick our brains right at the fingertips of any developer, not all of them bother. For only the most video gamey of video games, we have my favorite approach to the out of bounds, not caring at all. Games like Super Mario 64 and Trackmania have the world and the lack of world in clearly defined sections, roughly here and here. These are games that have absolutely no problem with you knowing in every sense that it is a video game. There's no attempt at realism because that's not the point. Your goal in Super Mario 64 is to collect stars, your goal in Trackmania is to race. Nothing else really matters. However, while most games fall under this general scale of immersion, from realistic to arcadey, there is actually a fourth category as to how games deal with the out of bounds. Minecraft is a game that is infinite. Wait, let me rephrase. Minecraft is a game that is functionally infinite in the X and Z directions. Okay, actually just one more time. Minecraft is a game that uses a preset algorithm that inputs a seed to generate a world that fits within a complex set of parameters to give the illusion of natural generation for a playable space that is functionally infinite for all gameplay purposes but does have an edge where it no longer functions correctly. See, being infinite is kind of a binary thing. Something either is infinite or it isn't, and when it comes to quote unquote infinite games, there is some point where it breaks. That point just so happens to be so far away that no human being would ever get there without actively trying to. But even then, with an inbound that would take millions of years to properly explore, what a game sacrifices to be functionally infinite is actually quite a lot. When you leave a world's generation up to a soulless algorithm, what special things you can add to a game are far more limited. You have an infinite space, but only so many biomes. Endless hills and valleys with only a certain amount of mobs. So many ores, so many blocks, so few things stretched out everywhere. The limits of the worlds we make don't get bypassed, they just get shifted. There are even games that take advantage of this sort of limited infinity. Manifold Garden is a game that is infinite in a very finite way. Every single room in the game has endless copies around it, and you, as the player, need to maneuver around by changing gravity and falling between them. By all definitions, this is infinite, but it somehow feels less open to me than any normal game. In a game like Titanfall 2, even if you know that the landscape around you is fake, you can at least imagine some sort of continuity to the world. When it comes to Manifold Garden, there is no such thing. It is this little island, all around you, over and over again, in a cold, white void, forever. While this video asks the question of why the Out of Bounds is so terrifying, it's important to note that it isn't always seen as scary. She says the YouTuber runs a series called Boundary Break, using modded camera tools to look outside of any game's bounds. In this series, the Out of Bounds is almost equivalent to a sandbox, with the secrets of the game's developmental history hiding just past what we're normally allowed to see. Yet, just like the Out of Bounds, this discovery process with video games is often taken for granted. Within the past few decades, scientists and art historians have been using an x-raying process to see beneath the surface of famous paintings. 
being able to see the bones of these famous works, the muscle and the cartilage, the veins, the blood, earlier versions, even entirely new, or I guess even older paintings, has given people a new perspective on the creative process. We're taking these iconic works, beloved and praised and analyzed for centuries, and finally seeing what the creators never intended for us. The Stanley Parable is a very, very, very meta game. You play as a faceless character named Stanley, an accountant, let's just say, at a nondescript corporate office. One day you realize that everyone has disappeared, and it's your job, with the help of a narrator, to find out what happened. Or you could do absolutely nothing that the narrator asked you to. The entire game is an adventure involving you either following or going against the narrator in order to discover as many different endings as you can. There is even an ending where your goal is to glitch yourself out of bounds in the very first room you step into. However, it is notably not disturbing in the slightest. At first, Stanley assumed he'd broken the map, until he heard this narration and realized it was part of the game's design all along. He then praised the game for its insightful and witty commentary into the nature of video game structure and its examination of structural narrative tropes. So, now that you're here, what do you think? Isn't this a fun and unique place to be? Why don't we take a minute just to drink it all in? Okay, I'm over it now. What do you think? Are you sick of this gag yet? As I said, it's a meta game. But, what if I told you there was an ending that you were never intended to find? While the game was revamped quite recently, the original version holds a secret. If you follow the narrator's intended path, you eventually find yourself uncovering the dark truth behind the company that Stanley works for. The journey the narrator intends for you brings you through an office, up to your boss, and through a winding series of hallways until you discover a mind control room. Deciding that the horror should continue no longer, Stanley shuts everything off. It ends with you escaping the facility, entering into a beautiful landscape with nothing but the freedom of the world in front of you. Until… the game resets, just like any other ending. If you follow this path again, or any other one, you're always stuck with the narrator and he's stuck with you. Except… if you go back to the first path, the one the narrator intends for you, you can do this. Here's the door. The game suddenly feels very different. The narrator is gone, and all you're left with is an empty office devoid of life, and really anything else. What's made creepier is that the game doesn't just break. After the door in front of you closes, a door to the bathroom, something that never opens in any other part of the game, becomes available. Not only that, but another door does too, one that's pitch black and loads an entirely new area. You're greeted with a series of hallways, climbing up the floors of the office building one at a time. After climbing six stories, you arrive at what is called the escape pod room. It's pitch black, with only a singular source of light at the end, the escape pod itself. But once you step too close... At the game's release, people who found this were convinced it was some sort of secret ending. On the poster leading up to the room, some text obscured by dirt in the game says that you need both the player and the narrator in order for the escape pod to work. Everyone was convinced that this was actually some sort of extra extra meta ending that requires you to find some way to access this with the narrator tagging along, but as the years went by, no such ending was ever found. In the Ultra Deluxe Edition that was released recently, there was actually a secret cutscene added if you bring along a bucket, bringing some sort of closure to this, and a fan-made mod was released for the original. This mod actually has new dialogue from the real voice actor for the narrator, which tells me that the escape pod ending in the first game was simply unfinished. It was an idea that was scrapped before the game was released, but wasn't removed entirely. However, while all of this acts as proof, it was very clear to me from the very first time I saw it that this was not meant to be seen. It's just so… eerie. It feels like something not made for us, something unfinished. At the same time, the ending that had the actual out of bounds isn't eerie by any means. The difference here, why one is unnerving and the other isn't, boils down to author intent. Even though we're shown the cold white void, the Stanley Parable was never trying to immerse us. As the narrator so sarcastically pointed out, the Out of Bounds ending is a commentary on video game structure, but this isn't a commentary on anything. 
All the wit and cheerfulness and life is gone. It's a human creation devoid of humanity. It feels tempting to compare it to something like a zombie. It's a person full of life that isn't anymore. It's a corpse that still walks. In a similar way, abandoned buildings have their own sort of terror to it. It's a place that humans aren't supposed to be anymore, and despite being dead, it still stands as well as it can. But these things, while dead, are incredibly human. Rot and decay are natural parts of our world, and like so many mythical creatures and horror monsters, they serve as extensions of our own natural fears. But what's natural about this? If you've been online long enough, you've come across images like this, called liminal spaces. Rather than being some imaginary place, it's rather a concept, and one that exists in reality. Many people have tried to define what it is, but we should start with what all of these images share, or rather lack humans. Even further, any sign of humans. There can be infrastructure and signage, clear evidence that people should be here, but they're not. And it almost feels like they never actually were. These places being photographed, too, are almost always somewhere or something that almost everyone knows. A playground, a nondescript hallway, even a famous music video. It's places that we've all seen or experienced that were designed to be full of life. People moving, talking, humans doing human things, but without us. It's artificial. It feels like everything is placed intentionally, mimicking the complexity and decay and life of our world, but falling flat, landing squarely in the uncanny valley. Liminal spaces grew in popularity around the same time as another internet trend. A modern day legend that's been spread around for the past couple years, of a place called the Backrooms. It all started with a single 4chan post. If you're not careful and you no clip out of reality in the wrong areas, you'll end up in the back rooms, where it's nothing but the stink of old moist carpet, the madness of mono yellow, the endless background noise of fluorescent lights at maximum humbuzz, and approximately 600 billion square miles of randomly segmented empty rooms to be trapped in. God save you if you hear something wandering around nearby, because it sure as hell has heard you. Just like the X-raying of paintings and exploration of the Out of Bounds, the backroom serves as the leftovers to our own reality. A place not made for us, but instead out of everything that wasn't. Similar to liminal spaces, the backrooms by design feel like a place created from all of humanity's collective unconscious. All the faded, blurry images of carpets and hallways merging together haphazardly and without any grand design, using our minds as parameters to generate a near infinite bounds. The Backrooms started as an idea around three years ago now, and funny story, I was actually a pretty early adopter. Just one month after the original post, I made a really shitty video quote unquote exploring the Backrooms. However, just like Kane Pixels, just like the community, and just like the original post itself, I missed the scariest part of the Backrooms, the connection between all of these games and their limits. When talking about darkness, people love to mention the fear of the unknown. In the Backrooms universe, every single game and short film and video has some type of monster. It begs to answer the question of the original post, what thing has heard you? But to be honest, I think the realer, deeper horror comes with the idea that there is nothing else at all. The thing you play as in Manifold Garden has a goal. You solve a series of increasingly complicated puzzles using fourth dimensional gates to travel between different infinitely large rooms. You work to grow the garden, one cube at a time, until you're finally able to make it past the final section of the game. And your reward for doing all of this... is death. To stop existing. You cannot die at any other part of the game. There are no monsters, there's no timers, or fall damage, or any existential threat. No, the problem is much bigger than that. While every single room in the game is infinitely large, you know exactly what it is and what it will be forever. There is no such thing as the unknown in this void. Every room is a prison cell that goes on forever, and a body and existence that you can never escape. It's an artificial immortality, devoid of life or change or meaning. The fear that we see in the void, in the back rooms, starts out natural. Like peering into a dark room, your brain goes wild with what might be lurking inside. Yet, 
After that brief moment, a greater, deeper fear sets in. The realization that there is truly nothing at all. It's like our brain breaks at the thought, the idea of infinite nothing, that it doesn't even connect with us until it's right there in front of our eyes. The natural result of a finite person creating a finite world, the remainder of infinity. Direct access to a place that's truly and entirely inhuman, a vacuum of absolute truth. Every time we play a game, we open a window into a world filled with human limits. A world of mistakes, failures, bugs, glitches, secrets, stories, beauty, and passion. These tiny islands of light stand strong and forever as monuments to humanity. All of our irrationality, the gap between functional truth and absolute truth, the unknown in all of our imagination and delusions. We humans might die, we hit our limits, just like any other day. But these worlds we create will last, just as flawed and human as the person who made it. A weak light, forever shining in the infinite darkness. Thank you, and have a nice day. I hope you enjoyed the video. This script was very difficult to make and I still don't know how well I really did on it, but I gave it my all. If you enjoyed this video and think you might like more, consider subscribing to my channel. I work very hard on the videos I make. Unrelated, but if you like Trackmania videos, Iceberg videos, or both, I helped voice a Trackmania Iceberg video on Lufik TM's channel if you want to check that out. Anyways, if you want to go even a step beyond and support me directly on my content, I have a Patreon that pays out only when I actually release a video. For just $2, it comes with a direct message line to me, access to sneak peeks of my videos, comes with a role in my Discord, and also gets your name at the end of all of my videos. Speaking of, shout out to my patrons, Jericho, Zimborg, Tommy the Cat, Ishii, and my newest two patrons, Haven and The One. Also, shout out to Massive, who paid me $50 to put his name above everyone else's on this specific video with a cooler and bigger font than everybody else. I made none of that up. With all of that out of the way, I'm glad you watched, and hopefully, see you next time.